Back in 1937, there was a man named Joseph Figlock who was a street sweeper in Detroit. Joseph Figlock was doing his job sweeping the streets when all of a sudden a baby fell on his head. It was rather alarming. A baby toppled out of a window but mercifully landed right on top of Joseph Figlock. Both he and the baby survived and recovered because he was in the right place at the right time. And a year later, Joseph Figlock was back at it, sweeping the streets of Detroit again, when a different baby fell out of a different window and also landed on Joseph Figlock's head. You can read about this in the 1938 Times if you have a little bit of spare time later on today. Once again, both Mr. Figlock and the baby survived and recovered from injuries. Joseph Figlock might have not felt like he was in the right place at the right time, but I guarantee you the baby's parents probably thought that he was. Have you ever had a moment where you felt like you were in the right place at the right time and it felt a little too good to just be a coincidence? Maybe you are an ER doctor and you were off duty when somebody had a cardiac episode and you were able to provide the need or provide the aid that they needed right on the spot. Maybe you were walking the streets of Disney World when you saw a child fall out of a stroller and you scooped him up and brought him back to his dad. Ask Pastor Brad about that story. It's a really good one. <laughs> or in my case, maybe you are sitting on a plane reading your pastoral ministry class book, Preaching and Preachers. And then somebody plops down next to you and opens up her book, Life and Teachings of the Buddha. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm not sure what to say, but God, I feel like this is probably on purpose, isn't it? Have you ever had moments like that? Well, if we read through the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, it sure seems like followers of Jesus do have moments like this. And that's no surprise because as the good Presbyterians we are here, we believe in a sovereign God who's in control of the universe, who knows everything that has happened and will happen. And we believe that he is at work through his Holy Spirit, in his people, his followers here on earth. So according to the Bible, we do believe that there are moments where God uses his followers in order to be in just the right place at just the right time to accomplish his work in the world. Now, when we hear that, that might provoke all sorts of different reactions. It might be exciting. Oh, I love the idea of being part of what God is doing in the world. It might be a little intimidating. I'd rather stay on the JV team. I'm happy just watching. I don't know if I feel so good about doing God's work. Maybe it's a little bit off-putting even. God seems to be moving pieces around on a chessboard. Or I don't know about sharing my faith in Jesus with people. Christianity works for me, but I'm a little hesitant to try to force my beliefs on somebody like that. Whatever your response might be this morning, whatever your reaction to this idea of God working in us and working in the world, I want to share with us a story this morning from the Bible in which God does put a follower of Jesus just in the right place at just in the right time. And he uses him to turn somebody's world upside down. And my hope is that as we hear about this story, it might inspire and encourage us that maybe God is at work in your world right around you. Maybe he wants to be at work within you. So let's see how that unfolds this morning. I'll be reading today from Acts chapter 8. We're going to be reading a story about a man named Philip. For those of you who are familiar with your many Philips in the New Testament, this is not Philip the disciple of Jesus it's Philip, one of the deacons who's ordained in Acts chapter 6. So let's pick up here in Acts chapter 8 with the story of Philip in verse 26. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. 
he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom do I ask you? Does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? So he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of our Lord for this morning. And as a disclaimer, it is a wacky word of the Lord. It's a really weird story. And there are probably questions that you have, like, did Philip just teleport? That I probably won't get to today. I'm really only going to focus on one core idea from the story. So here's our main idea today. Here's where we're headed. God is at work in the world through his Holy Spirit in his people. That's a bit of a mouthful. My seventh grade grammar teacher would be very disappointed at my liberal use of prepositional phrases. So let's break it down into two components. First, we'll talk about how God is at work in the world here in Acts and all around us. And then we'll talk about how he's at work in the world, how he uses his Holy Spirit to work in his people. So first, let's start with this idea number one, how God is at work in the world. And if you read the rest of Acts chapter eight, wow, is God at work. See, Philip is in this place called Samaria. You might've heard of Samaria before. It shows up in the Bible quite a few times and people are becoming believers in Jesus left and right in Samaria. Even the local magician converted to Christianity. Philip has to be thrilled. Going to Samaria and planting a church there is a really big deal for quite a few reasons. One of those reasons shows up back at the beginning of the book of Acts, the book we're studying this morning. Acts was written by a man named Luke. Luke wrote another book in the Bible, a book called Luke. We're very creative with our biblical names. Luke, the original book, was basically his summary of the teaching and the life of Jesus. And Acts, his sequel to Luke, is the summary of the disciples' lives, the original followers of Jesus, and how they shared the good news of what Jesus had done and how the early church began to spread around the world. One of the most important verses in Acts chapter 1, the beginning of this book, is when Jesus is having his final conference with his disciples in Jerusalem. Just a few weeks earlier, he had died on the cross and risen again from the grave. And he gives them this commission. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, this word witness can probably bring up all sorts of reactions When you think of witness, the picture that might come to mind is somebody standing on a ladder with a megaphone in downtown Fort Myers yelling at people that they're going to go to hell if they don't believe in God. We don't really love the word witness sometimes. But originally, this word witness is meant to conjure up a picture of a courtroom where the prosecution or the defense calls a witness that stands up, testifies under oath, and says, 
this is what I saw happen. This is what I experienced. Jesus' commission was for his disciples to say, look, your life has just been transformed. You've been forgiven of your sins. You have realized there's a bigger world and eternity that you never knew about. Your life has been changed. Now go live like that and share that with the world around you. That's what it means to be a witness. Now Jesus gave them some directive as to where they were to go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And there's some intentionality behind that phrase. On the next slide here, I have an ancient map of Israel. It looks rather impressive and well done, and that's because I didn't make it. I tried to make one in MS Paint, and it got rejected by our media team, who is far more competent at these things than me, and they put together this very fine-looking map. It's one of our many behind-the-scenes people here at the First Presbyterian Church that do a lot of the behind-the-scenes work. Um, but this map, in particular, gives us a picture of what uh, ancient Israel looked like, and you'll see that there are four red circles that are growing in size around Jerusalem at the center. The reason for that is if you hear Jesus' command to his disciples, witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, it functions as an outline for the whole book of Acts. In chapters 2 through 7, we read about the church growing in the city of Jerusalem. In chapter 8, we learn about it expanding to Judea, which was the surrounding towns, and Samaria, which was a little bit further out. And then, of course, that last fourth circle, the end of the earth, was to everywhere imaginable, the rest of the book of Acts. Now, here in Acts 8, where we're picking up this morning, a very important thing has just occurred in this development. In Acts chapter 8, we read that after the first deacon, Stephen, great name, by the way, after Stephen is killed for his faith, the disciples are scattered through the regions of Judea, and Samaria. If you remember Acts 1.8, and you remember our map with the circles, that circles two and three. Through Stephen's death, the gospel begins to spread to further regions than just the city of Jerusalem. The gospel is beginning to do incredible things. And our friend Philip, well, he is on the cutting edge. Philip is at the edge of circle three there. He's in that town called Samaria. And Samaria was a pretty big deal to go to because it was quite different than Jerusalem. If you're in Bonita Springs here, think Central Florida or maybe Alabama, right? Like it's a different culture. It's, you're still speaking the same language, but different people, different culture, different backgrounds. But in Samaria's case, there was also some hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews viewed the Samaritans as second-class citizens or as half-breed Jews, so the fact that the church is growing in Samaria and that people are becoming believers in Jesus in Samaria, well, that shows that this good news of Jesus Christ is breaking down social and cultural barriers and changing lives in ways people never imagined. Philip has to be ecstatic. I get to be the guy in Samaria planting the church and seeing Jesus change lives left and right until... God has a terrible idea. Has God ever had a terrible idea in your life before? Or at least it seemed like a really bad idea until 20 years later it suddenly made a lot more sense. Well, I bet you Philip felt like this was a pretty terrible idea of God's. Take a look at verse 26. This is where we began our story this morning. An angel of the Lord had said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And just to make sure we know what's going on here, Luke adds, this is a desert place. The Greek word for desert, eremos, it's where we get our English word hermit. <laughs> In other words, not a place you go to go tell people about Jesus. There's nobody there. Wait a minute, God. I was on the cutting edge. I was on circle three. The local magician just converted. And you're sending me to... The desert? Think of it this way. Imagine you're working with a new business startup here in Bonita Springs. You're having a really good experience. You're turning a profit. The reputation is growing. So one day the CEO calls you into her office and says, hey, good news. 
We're doing so well that I'm going to send you to a new location. We're going to start a new branch and you're going to be in charge. Oh boy, a promotion. That's great news. Where do you want me to go? And she says, I'm going to have you go start the business smack in the middle of Alligator Alley. <laughs> you ever driven Alligator Alley? There's not much there besides like one rest stop where all the birds in Southern Florida prey on the food of unsuspecting tourists. Right? You don't go to Alligator Alley to start a business. People travel the road, sure, but nobody's actually there. Well, that's what this ancient road from Jerusalem to Gaza was like. It was this desert road that didn't have cities on it. It didn't have places on it. People traveled it to get from place to place, but it's a highway. You're not stopping the chat. You've got places to be. Philip has to feel like he's getting demoted from the varsity team. Life was going so well until God sent him to the deserts. And some of you know what it feels like for God to send you to the deserts, don't you? King David talks about deserts in the Psalms kind of in a spiritual way. God, I long for you. You feel so far away. It's like I'm in a parched desert with nothing to drink. Maybe you're in a spiritual desert this morning where you've been wrestling with depression or anxiety or a sense that God just seems to have forgotten about you. Or maybe your deserts of a more physical nature. Life was going really well until that unexpected diagnosis at a routine doctor's visit for you or a loved one. And now everything's upside down. Deserts can look all sorts of different ways. Why does God send us to deserts? Well, it's shocking that God sends Philip to the desert. But the only more shocking thing is what happens when Philip goes to the desert. We'll pick up the story. In verse 27, Philip obediently goes to the desert. We're not told how he goes, but I imagine he goes with slumped shoulders, feeling really sad about it. But he goes to the desert nonetheless, obediently. And then something happens. The ESV, though I love it dearly, as you can tell by the fact that my Bible looks like it's been through a washing machine, um, the ESV kind of papers over how the original Greek captures this idea. In, Phil, or rather in Luke's original writing, it reads, Philip went to the desert, and behold, a eunuch! <laughs> he probably didn't use that tone. That was me. I hope you're awake now if you weren't before. Um, this Greek word, behold, it's like a neon sign flashing saying, hey, look at this. This is pretty important. Okay, Luke, what's the big deal about a eunuch? An Ethiopian eunuch. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Ethiopia. I have one more map for us, and then I promise we're done with maps. I know it's still rather early in the morning. But as you can see, all the way up here at the top, we have the location of ancient Israel. All the way down at the bottom, we have in that red circle there, the modern nation of Ethiopia. In between, that other red circle is labeled Sudan, where modern Sudan is today. That's roughly the location of the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia. As you can tell, it is rather far away from Israel, especially because planes and cars did not yet exist. It was a good travel to get there. In fact, Ethiopia was so far away that some called it the ends of the earth. Now, if that rings a bell, it's because you were awake about 10 minutes ago. When Jesus gave his disciples this commission in Acts 1.8, where did he say they would go? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Philip thinks he's getting knocked off of circle three going to the desert, when in actuality, he's getting promoted to circle four. Philip is about to go get to share the good news of Jesus with a black man from Africa who is a Gentile, who is a different skin tone than the people that believe in Jesus, a different background than the people that believe in Jesus, as a eunuch, who could not have kids, he physically wasn't allowed to convert to become a Jew. Every social, cultural, racial barrier imaginable is about to be shattered by the gospel. And Philip thought he was getting demoted. Could it be that the desert road God has sent you to, be it your health or your spirit, could it be that maybe he didn't mess up? 
Maybe it's not a bad idea. Maybe there's somebody else on that same desert road that he has for you to meet because you have living within you the news of Jesus Christ that can transform a life. So how exactly then does that work? We talked about how God's at work in the world. He's at work in the desert. He's at work in Acts. He's at work today. But how does he work? That's what we'll see with this second idea, how God works through his Holy Spirit. The story goes on in verse 29 when we're told that the Spirit speaks to Philip and says, go over and join this chariot. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, depending on your background, if you're relatively new to church or if you grew up in a church that didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can kind of feel like that estranged uncle at a family reunion with kind of crazy hair. You don't really know him. You know he's part of the family, but you're kind of okay if he stays over there with your third cousins. The Holy Spirit, though, is actually a tremendous gift of God that has the power to radically transform the way we approach our lives. But we're told in the Bible that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that he sends his spirit to live in you. We're also told in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is God himself. That God is one God in three persons. That God the Father is God, Jesus Christ is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So those of you math teachers out there, you remember the transitive property of equality? A equals B, B equals C, then A equals C. If the Holy Spirit's God and the Holy Spirit lives in you, that means God himself lives inside of you. Go ahead, look at your neighbor. You see that very normal looking person? God himself lives in them. This is bananas. Why do we forget about this? But the same God who spoke light into creation at 186,000 miles a second, he lives in you if you're a believer in Jesus. That kind of changes the game a little bit, don't you think? Now, the Holy Spirit, he does all sorts of things in the Bible. But one of the most important things he does, we're told about in the book of John, chapter 16. Jesus tells his disciples that the spirit of truth, another name for the Holy Spirit, that he will guide you into all truth. Now, the Holy Spirit guides in a host of different ways. In Philip's case, it seems like he speaks audibly to Philip. That might not happen to you, but the Holy Spirit might guide you through making a scripture passage just jump out and come to life. Or he might guide you when you're praying and a person's face comes into your mind and you just get a, a nudge somewhere inside that says, gosh, I should reach out to them. One way or another, if we're followers of Jesus, we believe that the Holy Spirit himself lives in us and that he's guiding us. He's at work in the world around us but he's in work inside of us too. And notice how he guides Philip. Obediently, Philip runs up to the chariot where he discovers that this Ethiopian eunuch from miles and miles away somehow is a believer in the God of Israel. We're not told how. We're also told that this eunuch just happens to be reading the book of Isaiah on his chariot ride back home and also just happens to be reading a prophecy about Jesus from the book of Isaiah. You heard it in Acts chapter 8, verses 32 and 33. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. This is the famous servant song in Isaiah 53, a prophecy that Jesus Christ fulfilled. And the eunuch literally says to Philip, hey, could you, could you tell me who this guy's talking about? Are you kidding me? Talk about a softball. Philip goes on. He shares the good news of Jesus. They go by a pool of water because, of course, there's a pool of water in the desert. So as you do, they get baptized. And then Philip moves on. The eunuch goes on. But what are the odds of a man from Ethiopia who just happens to be a believer in God, just happens to be reading a prophecy about Jesus from the book of Isaiah when Philip is on the desert road. The odds are probably lower than Joseph Figlock getting in the head, getting hit in the head by two separate babies in two separate years. Here's what I want you to see. If this is true, not just that the Holy Spirit lives in and works in you, but that he's also working in the people and in the world around you, suddenly that means maybe you don't need to know all the answers to all the questions to share your faith in Jesus. 
Suddenly it means it's not all up to you to fix the world's problems or help somebody out who's struggling. You're actually partnering with a God who's already doing that work. I want to tell you a story about how I saw this unfold in my own life a few weeks ago. I was getting my hair cut at a local barber, and as my wife will tell you, um, if I don't have social interaction for more than about eight and a half minutes, I really start to struggle. Um, So I usually try to befriend various strangers. I'm an awful person to sit next to on a plane because I don't let my neighbors sleep. I'm just trying to pester them and see if they'll become my newest best friend. Um, I got my dental hygienist's phone number the other day. We we hit it off, so we were going to hang out. And my wife was saying, you have have stuff in your mouth the whole time. How How does that even work? Right? Um, But nonetheless, I was chatting with my barber and found out she liked to write. So I said, oh, great. What do you like to write about? And she said something like this. I like to write about the esoteric conflicts and the the meaning of religion. Um, I like to write about the religious mysticism and the cycles of time in the universe and how everything is a farce. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. I hope a knowledgeable pastor finds and talks to this woman someday. (laughs) Because I got no idea what to say. As we talked and the conversation went on, I I discovered her worldview was almost more Buddhist or more of an Eastern religion worldview. And and I don't really know a whole lot about Eastern religion or about Buddhism. So I felt really ill-equipped, right? Like, all right, here's the pastor. Like, she's definitely spiritually seeking. I don't know what to say or do. So I just listened and we talked for a while. And I noticed over time that inadvertently she quoted the Bible a couple times. You know, like the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So mindful that she had very sharp objects close to my face, I took a stab in the dark and said, hey, I I don't know how you feel about this, but by any chance, have you ever read the Bible? And her jaw dropped as she said, I've been wanting to. Where do you think I should start? Oh, I can do that conversation. Yeah, okay, like now we're in my wheelhouse. But it, it was such a revelation to me of, wait, wait a minute, I don't need to like know all the ins and outs of Eastern religion and all of the questions to my faith in order to be used by God. I've just got to realize the Holy Spirit's already working on people on the desert road right around me. How can I go be a part of that? And maybe God has a plan for you to be a part of that in the week or weeks to come. So let's talk about a couple ways as we begin to wrap up here, a couple ways that God might be at work in you in the next weeks. Firstly, I think if we take this idea home that the Holy Spirit's at work in and around us, it's an encouragement to trust God when he sends you to the desert. Maybe you resonated with that desert road description or maybe you know somebody on a desert road. We all have them at one point or another. Times when life falls apart and we're saying, God, what's this bright idea all about? But if God reached to the ends of the earth on a desert road, well, then maybe he has you on a desert road for a reason too. Maybe there's somebody else traveling your same desert road and you are the Philip that has been sent to that chariot in a sandstorm. Maybe God has a purpose for you on this desert road after all. And secondly, I think this is an inspiration for us to keep our eyes open for exit signs. And here's what I mean by that idea. Have you ever been on one of those excruciatingly long road trips where Siri says, you know, just stay straight for 361 miles on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, then slight right? You don't really pay attention to the exits that you're passing. You're just going straight. There's nothing that concerns you. You don't have to pay attention to the exits. But if you have a child in that car that has to go to the bathroom, suddenly the exit signs become much more relevant. And you are scouring the interstate looking for where is the next exit because that's relevant to me now. I wonder if we were to go into our week expecting that God's Holy Spirit is at work in the people around us on the desert road. How might that change the way we interact with and approach people? Because when we expect to see something, odds are we will. As we think about this and get ready to go into our weeks, there's one last important story from Acts 8 that I think is important for us to know. Because, see, odds are the Ethiopian eunuch's story doesn't end here. We're just told he goes on his way rejoicing. But this man who couldn't become a Jew, who knows the God of Israel, who's probably mystified as to what does it look like to be a faithful follower of him, his life's just been changed. 
I can't help but think that as he goes home, he's just going to keep on reading this book of Isaiah now that he knows who it's really about. And three chapters later, the eunuch would have discovered this prophecy in Isaiah 56 as he continued to read. This is God speaking. Let not the eunuch, the eunuch, say I am a dry tree. I can't have children, which is everything in the ancient world. God says, I will give a monument better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. While our first century Ethiopia records are a little bit spotty, church tradition has it that this eunuch went home, shared the good news of Jesus with his homeland, and that one of the most ancient churches that still traces its roots historically back claims its spiritual lineage from this man. A man who could not have kids went on to become a spiritual father to over a million people. This is what Jesus does. He changes lives. He turns lives upside down and he does it in the desert. Maybe he wants to do it through you. Maybe he wants to do it in you. I'll invite you to bow your heads and pray with me as we close. Lord God, we believe that you are at work in the desert and you're at work in our deserts. You know what's going on and you know what we need. So we pray that you will open our eyes, that you will help us see your spirit is at work around us. Will you change our lives? Give us water in our deserts and help us be bearers of good news to those you send us to on our desert roads. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.